Luke chapter 13 is where we're at right now. We read as we pick up at verse 13, verse 1. Of course, we're going to go back. We've already looked through those first 17 verses, but I want to recapture them. So to bring our study into its proper context as we continue on. So we're going to back up to Luke chapter 13, verse 1. It says, now on the same occasion. Now, we've got to consider what was the occasion? What was happening? What was, what was, what was being said? And we'll back up to verse 54 to, to, where, to see where we left off in chapter 12. And he, he was also saying to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, a shower is coming, and it turns out. And when you see a south wind blowing, you say, it will be a hot day, and it turns out that way. You hypocrites, you know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and the sky, but why do you not analyze the present time? You, 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 you guys understand. You can see certain signs. You can put these signs together and understand what's going on and what's about to happen. He said, why, not, why are you not analyzing the present time? Now, when we, can, when we consider that, we, we often think of end times, right? But what we could also do in a personal application, this is one thing we didn't get into last time we were in a study, is what is our personal present time? You can see what's happening here. You can see that you're aging, that you're getting older, that this body is deteriorating, it's falling apart. You can see what's happening. What, what, why are you not considering where you're at personally? That's one of the ways we can apply that. He says, and why do you not even on your own initiative judge what is right? For while you are going with your opponent to appear before the magistrate, and on your way there, make an effort to settle with him so that he may not drag you before the judge and the judge turn you over to the officer and the officer throw you into prison. He says, you know, just think this out practically. You know, let's, let's, be, let's be pragmatic. You know, you, if, you, if you know that if you end up in a court, you're going to pay a huge fine or you're going to be thrown in the prison, but there's a way to get out of that, why not take that avenue? And that's what Jesus is offering to each and every one of us. We can read the signs and signs. We can see, hey, there, our life is eventually going to come to an end. And we know that we're going to be studied, you know, standing before the judge of all time. We know that's going to happen. There's a way out, though. And, 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 and that way out is through His grace, through His forgiveness. He's shown us His love. He died upon the Calvary. We can see that love. We can see what He's offering to us. Why not lay hold of that? Listen to what he goes on to say. He says, verse 59, I say to you, you will not get out of there until you paid every last cent. We owe God, our Creator, this enormous debt. This enormous debt. But we can't even pay a little cent, if you will, of that debt. It can't be paid. That's what the entire Old Testament is showing us, teaching us. We can't even pay the most minute debt. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about if we're thrown into that, that place of outer darkness, we're going to remain there for all eternity. And, you know, and as we get into the context here, Jesus is talking to Jews here, those who've had this law for 1,500 years at this point. They've had the law. This law has been showing them how far they are from God, and showing them what such a great debt is owed, and yet they're still trying to cling and live by a religious system. That's the context. Continuing on. Verse uh, chapter 13, he says, There were some present who reported to him about the, uh, the Galileans and, and, the, and the blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus said to them, do you, you, do you suppose these Galileans were greater sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the Tower of Salaam had, had, had killed or fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men of Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will likewise perish. See, we have the tendency to look at other people and say, well, because 
you know, he's crippled or because he's sick. This is actually the Jewish mindset. Well, if he's sick, if he's crippled, if he's blind, if he's lame, obviously he's cursed of God. And if you're healthy and wealthy and prosperous, well, then obviously you're blessed of God. That was their line of thinking. And so when someone died a horrendous death, it was like, whoa, man, they must have done something really bad. And Jesus is saying, no, every single one of you are just the same. There's no difference between Adolf Hitler and Billy Graham, and, and, and that is earning your way into heaven or earning your way into hell. There's no difference between the two. Billy Graham is not in heaven because he was such a good guy, because he preached all these uh, sermons of, and of evangelism. Adolf Hitler is not in hell because he is a bad guy, because he killed six million Jews. That's not why he's in hell. You see, when we're born, we're all headed for hell. We're all on the same train that's headed for hell. We're all predestined for hell. Now, there's a way off of that train that's predestined for hell, and that's through the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. We get on the train of salvation at that point. The reason that Adolf Hitler is in hell is not because if he did, we don't know where he was at in his last moment, but if he's in hell, it's because he rejected God. And then the reason that Billy Graham is in heaven is not because of what he did, but because he received God. And if we're going to go to heaven, we're going to go to heaven in the exact same way. We're going to go on into heaven through his grace and forgiveness for all of our sin, past, present, and future. We don't earn our way into heaven. And that's what Jesus is telling the, 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 these of, of the Galileans and, and those who, who died this felt this, this, these horrible deaths. He says, hey... You can die the exact same way. You're no better, you're no worse than those guys who died such a horrible fate. And he began te <coughs> telling his, his, this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit, and on it he did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, the, the three years I have, come, uh, I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any, Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? Why is it even, you know, it only, it's, just, it's just sucking up the nutrients of the ground. It's a waste, this guy says. And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too I will dig around it and put, um, put in fertilizer. And he says, and if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if it does not, cut it down. And, uh, in other words, God is patient. He's waiting. He's waiting for you to make that personal decision. He's waiting for you to put off religion and put on this relationship with him. But his patience only lasts a certain amount of time. There's a point for each one of us that we will come to that point where it's a final decision, where we've run out of time. And, when, and, and it's at that point he cuts us down. And any tree, any fruit, any vegetation that was cut down always goes into the fire. So that's, one, that's his warning. There's not a whole lot of time. You know, he's patient. He loves you. He's demonstrated his love for you. He wants you to have heaven. You know, I, there was a Facebook post just a couple of weeks ago that I posted out there. I shared it from someone else's page. And it basically said that people who are in hell are not in hell because God rejected them. They're in hell because they rejected God. And God is saying, I love you. I want a relationship with you. Have you received that? Are you, or are you rejecting him? And there's only so much time. Each and every one of us, our days are numbered. My, my years might be 54 and a half years, or it might be 94 and a half years. We don't know, though. We don't know how much time we have. Verse uh, 10, and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on, on the Sabbath. And there was a woman who had, who for 18 years had a sickened, uh, had, had a sick and <laughs> sickness, sorry, sickness caused by a spirit, and she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called for her and said to her, said to the woman, "Woman, you are freed from your sickness." And he and he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect and began glorifying God. So for eighteen years, she put her faith in Jesus or in God. She was attending the synagogue. But for 18 years, she suffered. 
And that's where we're at a lot of times. We, you know, for, we've gone through a sickness. We've gone through tragedy. We've been, you know, doubled over, bent down, held captive. You know, maybe some of us for five years, maybe for some of us for 20 years. But the, the point is, she just kept going. And so, too, if we're going to receive healing, if we're going to receive salvation, we've got to keep going. Now, Jesus lays her hands upon her, and immediately she's made well. You see, it wasn't the law. It was not the religion. It was not a program. It was Jesus who made this woman well. And that's what he's, he's telling these stories because these people are relying on their religious system. And they're relying on the religious system. It's not going to be the religious system that heals us, that gives us life. It's going to be Jesus. And when he, when he reaches out, when he touches you, you are set free. You, you, you are set free today. You, you see, when he touches us, he gives us life, life in the Spirit. It's that life in the Spirit that enables me to let go of alcohol, that let, enables me to let go of whatever's holding me bondage, let go of that drug or what have you, or let go of that root of bitterness, that, that pain that's, that's been holding on to us. We can let go. We have a choice now. We don't have to live in bondage. That's the whole point here. These people had the law. They've been hanging on to this law. They're hanging on to the law at this point when Jesus is teaching them. And his, he's, he's communicating to them, you can be set free. Just receive me. But the synagogue official was indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. That's not a part of our religious system. That's not a part of our religious program. You see, the, it was unorthodox what Jesus had done here. He healed on the Sabbath. That's a day of rest. And also, so too, when we make changes in a, in a church program or in a church setting, you know, oftentimes those people who, who have been around some years, the traditionalists, they say, wait a minute, that can't happen here. And they get upset. They get uptight. Because what they've truly been hanging on to is their system, is their program. And it's not a program. It's not a system. It's Jesus. He says there are six days in which the work, or should, work should be done. Some, so come during the, <laughs> sorry, so come during them and get healed, and not on the Sabbath. The Sabbath day is not a time to get healed. So what they didn't understand was that the Sabbath day was, you know, because we were told in Genesis that Jesus, or I'm sorry, God worked six day, but on the seventh day he rested. Now, was it because God says, man, I've been speaking here for six days. Woo-hoo, I'm wiped out. I've got to rest. Is that the reason he rested? Was it because he was wiped out? Was it because he was tired? Is it because he needed rest? No, he rested because the work was done. It was complete. And that's what's being communicated here. You know, because in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, it talks about all these rests. The Jews did this and rested. They did that and they rested, but they were always talking about a greater rest. And the end result, that, that, that final verse in, that, in the Gen- Hebrews chapter 4, is that Jesus Christ is our rest. Rest was standing right in front of them. Right in front of them. The one who would accomplish the task. The one who would finally give them rest from the works of the law. From the religious system. They, if they recognized him, they could say, man, we don't need this religious program all anymore. We have him. All we got to do is embrace him. He's the rest. That's what the entire Old Testament was about. It was pointing to the greater rest, who is Jesus Christ. Rest was standing before them. And they didn't get it. They didn't understand it. But the Lord answered and said, you hypocrites, does not each one of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 years, should she not have been released from the bond of that on the Sabbath day? Look, man, you, you guys are a bunch of hypocrites. If your ox is in a hole, you're going to drag him out of the hole. But now you're all caught up in your religious system. You're, you know, you're all uptight because Jesus has done something here that's unorthodox. You hypocrites. And again, they didn't understand rest. Jesus said from the cross at Calvary, it is finished. The, the work is done. You get to rest. Take it easy, guys. 
You're going to heaven. If you just simply receive what I've done here, you're going to heaven. I thought you were raising your hands. Hey, i got something to say here. <laughs> In verse 17, finally, after, <laughs> after 20 minutes of review, and he said this, all of his opponents were being humiliated. The entire crowd was rejoicing all the glorious things being done by him. Of course, the crowd's Man, these guys are a bunch of hypocrites, but now Jesus has called them out on the carpet. And they said, whoa, finally somebody's, you know, called a spade a spade. Now, finally, we're picking up in chapter 13, verse 18. And, he was, and so he was saying, what is the kingdom of God like? And what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and threw into his garden, and it grew and became a tree. And the birds of the air nested in its branches. He say he's talking about in another, in another uh, gospel. He tells us that the, you know he identifies this this mustard seed as being the smallest of all seeds, and yet it's thrown into the ground. And then suddenly, this mustard seed, this mustard grows into the size of a tree. What we're talking about here is unnatural growth. This has grown much bigger than what it's supposed to grow. This mustard plant. You know, the mustard plants don't ordinarily get the size of a tree. And so we're talking about unnatural growth. This is the growth that was unexpected. And what he's talking about and pointing to is the church. The church. You know, there's going to be you know, some really big churches, but when this church grows so big, there's certain branches out there, the birds of the air will come and light on them. In the Bible, the birds of the air always speak of evil. There's going to be evil that will settle in. And a lot of people will point to this evil and say, Ah, oh, man, you know, this, look what this church is doing. That's evil. You know, that's why I don't go to church, because this, that, or the other. Look at this evil. You see the evil in the branches of it. Notice what Jesus goes on to say, though. And, he, and, he, and again, he said, To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven. Leaven, you know, you know what leaven is, right? It's what, you know, you plug some leaven into a, a, a lump of dough, and that leaven will cause the, the lump of dough to grow, to spread, to puff up. He says, it is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. So she took some leaven and she pl plugged it into this flour, and then it began to leaven, it began to grow, it began to swell, became really big and puff up and prideful. And again, he's pointing to the church. This is the kingdom of heaven. You see, when people start pointing their fingers at the church, talking about the evil that's in the church, I don't have to defend it. You know why? Because Jesus said it was going to happen. <laughs> why do I need to defend it? But also leaven, you also got to think, that it, can, it speaks of works. You know, when, when I start doing things, when I get first get saved, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. But then as suddenly I get in my mind, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to do the other in order to be saved. You see, when you start thinking in that way, that I've got to do this in order to be saved, well, then you're in big trouble. You're, 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 you're adding to your salvation. Paul gave great warning in the, in the book of Galatians concerning adding to our salvation. You say, well, I've got Jesus and i got Jesus, but you start adding to your salvation. Paul says, you add anything to the gospel of grace, you have fallen from grace, and you have severed yourself from Christ. You see, you can fall away from this salvation that has been gloriously and generously given to you. When you start adding to it, I need to do this, that, and the other to get saved. And it uh, and also speaks of a religion, you know, well, I've got to practice. You know, maybe I'll start off and say, man, I'm going to start having my own personal morning devotions. I'm going to open up my Bible and spend some time with Jesus in the morning. And, and then you start doing that. Now you start adding that, saying, well, I've now got to do that in order to be saved. This is when all kinds of confusion will begin to settle in. This is where you're going to find yourself drifting away from your salvation. If you would turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve have been created. 
They've been placed in this perfect garden paradise. In this perfect garden paradise, they're walking with God. They're talking with God. They're communing with God. They got this love relationship with God. And so, and God had only given them one commandment. One commandment, one commandment only. He was in effect saying, Adam, Adam, you and I are now in this love relationship. We've got this relationship. If you need anything, if you, if you have any questions, then all you've got to do is come and ask of me. And that's what God, Adam did. He, he would come to God. God, what about this? God, what about that? This, this, this tree of knowledge, if you will. God himself was there. And all Adam knew up to this point was good. That's all he knew. And God said, Adam, you've got a choice to be in this relationship. But you don't have to be in this relationship. Eat of that tree, and you can determine for yourself what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is evil. Just eat of that tree. But I warn you, if you eat of that tree, you're going to become severed from me. You and I will not be in a relationship. You, in effect, will die spiritually. So Adam had placed Adam and Eve in this tree, or in this garden. Now, we're picking up, and at this point, Satan is coming to Eve, his wife. It says, now, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed. So now here comes Satan. He's trying to get in between Adam and Eve and and God. He's trying to sever this relationship. And he's the most crafty, the, the, the most crafty beast of all the field. He's the most cunning, devising. You know, he, he, he's, he thinks things through. He figures out how to, to, to attack his prey. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said. The very first thing he does is to bring into question what God has done. And that's what we hear all the time. You know, do you really believe that? Did real, is that really what the Bible says? Maybe you're a little confused about that. So the very first thing the world does is to bring into question what God has said. Just, oh, they're trying to bring in just a little bit of leaven, you see. Just a little bit of leaven. We could corrupt this entire thing by bringing in just a little bit of leaven. Has God really said? So that's what Satan does. He comes in and he says, has God said, get you questioning, get you doubting. He says, has God, uh, verse, uh, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, from the trees, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. So, Satan says, has God really said, now he's trying to twist what God has said here. Has God really said you can't eat from any tree of the garden? And of course, we know from chapter 2, He says, you may eat freely from any tree. So he's trying to turn things around here, spin it. God says, you can eat any tree, from any tree. And Satan says, he said, has he really said, you can eat from any tree? As if he's saying, you can't eat, you cannot eat from any tree. And the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. She got it. God says, you can eat from any tree except for one. And God has says, you can't eat from that or touch it. There's the problem. Or touch it. You can't touch it. That's not what God said. Turn back one page. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not touch. You shall not eat. You shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. You see, they added a rule. They added a rule to this. God has said, don't eat from that tree. And Adam, over his wife, might have said, you know, Eve, God said, don't eat from that. Don't even touch it. Don't even touch it. We don't want, we, 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 we should not even touch that. You see, they added a rule to their salvation. They added a regulation 
to their salvation. I'm not even going to touch that. Now, Satan was able to take this religion they added to their salvation and manip manipulate them, twist it. As God says, you truly can't eat from any tree of the garden. And Eve responds, no, he did not say we couldn't eat from any tree. He said we could eat from any tree of the garden, except for this one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and, and God says we should not eat it or touch it. Now look what happens. Oh. For God knows that in the day that we that you eat, oh, I'm sorry, the serpent said, verse 4, the serpent said, chapter 3, verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you shall not die. He, you're not going to die if you eat of that. You're not going to die if you touch that. And I can just imagine Eve standing there. Now he's just flat out called God a liar because she's added a rule, a regulation to a religion, and now they, they're looking at this, and well, let's test this out. Maybe she wretched up there and touched the fruit. I didn't die. Or maybe she was thinking, now that I've touched it, I might as well eat it. <laughs> you know, I've already stumbled. You know, I, I've, already, I've already smelled the pot. I might as well smoke it. <laughs> so, there's a rule there. They've broken the rule. And now they think they're condemned. They think they're, they're going to hell because they've broken a rule. See, that's the problem with the rule. It, it, it confuses us. It condemns us when we, you know, we've added to what God has said. That's what Paul says. If you add anything to this gospel of grace, you have severed yourself from Christ. You have fallen from grace. If you add this rule, this regulation. Turn with me to Colossians real quickly. Colossians chapter 2, verse 20. Now, we're getting to the heart of this matter here. Picking up Colossians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul writes, If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, if you've died to a religious system, if you died to the idea that you can reach God in your own strength and power, he says, Why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not touch, or taste, do not touch. Why do you add these rules and regulations to your life? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. If you've already died to this idea that you can't reach God through rules and regulations and guidelines, why are you adding these rules, regulations, and guidelines to your salvation? I'm not saying rules, regulations, and guidelines are entirely evil. What I'm saying is if you're trying to add them to your salvation, Paul's bringing that question into mind. Why are you adding these things? Which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. Of men. Deny, 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 deny. Those are teachings of men. These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body but are no value against fleshly indulgences. Now we're getting to the heart of this. There's no value in fleshly indulgences. Say, so, you know, I've got this porn addiction, so therefore, I'm not going to look at women anymore. I'm not going to look at magazines, I'm not going to look at the TV, I'm not going to look at that, this, that, and the other. So, I've got this addiction. So I'm going to deny myself of all these indulgences. Has that changed my heart? Has not changed my heart. It cannot change my heart. A rule cannot change my heart. A religion cannot change my heart. That's what the entire Old Testament was about. That's the point that Jesus is making in chapter 13. Religion can't change your heart. Only I can change your heart. That's what Paul's point is here. He's saying... These are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom. It seems wise to set up this perimeter for myself in order to be saved. He says, but it was no value against fleshly indulgences. 
You know, the, the, the Jesus had uh, given this example. He said, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. You know, someone commits adultery. We can point our finger, ah, you committed adultery. You're going to hell. He said, but I would have you know, if you even look at a woman with lust in your heart, you have committed adultery. We, we commit adultery in our heart. A rule's not going to change our heart. A regulation's not going to change my heart. Saying I'm, going, I'm not going to touch this, that, or the other is not going to change my heart. Now, I'm not saying that rules and regulations is not a good thing because I know, well, here's the deal. The point here is, when Jesus moves in, he's able to change your heart. Which means, you know, because I have this addiction to porn, maybe, and looking at porn and studying porn and doing that or the other, I don't have to make a rule to, to avoid Walmart. I don't have to make a rule to avoid uh, this other store, to, to, to not look at this magazine. What, what can happen is, if I have that a problem, I now have, because Jesus has moved in, because the Holy Spirit has moved in, to say, no, I'm not going to look at that. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to think that way anymore. I have the power of choice. I'm, I can say, no, I'm not going to smoke cigarettes anymore. I'm not, not saying that this is something that you, it's a personal relationship we were talking about. That I'm not going to drink anymore. I'm not going to smoke pot anymore. You have the power to do that. He moves in. It's not a program. It's not a religion. It's Jesus. He moves in, and His Spirit gives you the power to say no over this flesh. When this flesh starts making demands, I can say, no, I'm not going to answer that demand anymore. Now, the enemy's going to come in and say, man, you've got to have that or you're going to die. I, no, I don't have to listen to that because Jesus has moved in. His Spirit gives me the power to say no. If you want power, the power is Jesus. He touched this woman, remember, and she straightened up. She was set free. She, did, she no longer had to live a life bent over, doubled up, you know, or, or chained down. She had the power to say no. Or to say, I'm free. <laughs> that was a long way to get to a simple point, wasn't it? All right, let's go back to Luke chapter 13. And he was passing through one of the cities in a village, uh, one city to, in a village to another, teaching the, and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. Here's the point. Jesus is now on his way to Jerusalem. What's going to happen when he gets to Jerusalem? He's going to be arrested. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be crucified. And three days later, he's going to rise up. He's now on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way to die. And someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? You know, surely, Jesus, we're exclusive here. There's just a handful of us that are going to be saved here, right? Just a handful of us. So he's looking at this, and he's, he's feeling a bit prideful. A little bit of love in his movement, a little bit of pride. Hey, we're an exclusive group here. There's just a few that's going to be saved. Jesus answers that as he continues on. He says, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Strive to enter through this narrow door. This narrow door. There's only one way in. I remember Noah. You know, he preached for 100 years. There was one door that people could enter in through. One door on that ark. There was no back door. There was no escape hatch. There was one door. And God was the one that was controlling that door. And that one door, of course, is through grace and forgiveness. It's not through a religion. It's not through a program. It's through that one door, Jesus. Strive to enter that through, through that one door. Here's the reason he says this, because we get saved. We start going to church. And then we start adding things to our salvation. That word strive, another word that could be used there is agonize. Agonize over this. Keep your focus on Him and agonize over this. 
Strive to keep your focus on Him, on this one way, this one door. Strive, agonize. See, here's the deal. A religion is really easy, really simple, right? Because all i got to do is check off. Well, I've done this, I've done that, I've done the other. Religion is a simple thing. Because, you, well, if I go to church on Sunday, if I read my Bible, if I give time, well, shoot, I'm good. I'm going to heaven. Because we're looking at this as association. But it's not about association. It's about relationship. And relationships are hard. They're difficult. Because a relationship requires me to change. The relationship trans- requires me to give up certain things, certain ideas, certain beliefs. Trust me, it's hard. For 36 years, Tammy and I have been married. And it hasn't been a bed of roses. We've had to give. We've had to take. You know, and, and shortly a time ago, she said, um, you were a very difficult person to live with. And I was like, what? You were the difficult one. <laughs> because that's, that's a relationship. Because it, it, it's give and take. You see, we're not entering into religion. And this is something we've got to strive over, agonize over. We've got to keep our focus on one another because I take my focus off of her and start looking over other women, then there's going to be a strain here, you see. If I take my focus off of her and start focusing on my hobbies, there's going to be a strain here. We've got to keep our focus on one another. We've got to agonize. And again, I hate to do this, but tonight as we get into the Song of Solomon, we're going to see this beautiful relationship and the agonizing that took place in this relationship at certain points. It's, it's, it's something he says, strive, agonize. Get your focus upon me. Put off this flesh. And it's hard to put off this flesh. It's hard to put off my wants, my desires. It's hard to give in to, to what Tammy wants at times. It's hard for her to give in to what I want at times. It's, it's something we got to stay focused upon, though. It's not just come to church on Sundays, give your tithe, and take communion, and you're good. That's a religion. He says, once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, that's what happened in Noah's day, they had 100 years to get on that ark, to walk into that, through that door. They had 100 years, 120 to be specific, and 120 years to go through that door. He says, but here, once that door was shut, it was not going to open again until God opened that door. Once that door was shut, everyone else was shut out. Turn with me to Revelation, if you would. Revelation chapter 3. Jesus is talking to the church of the last days. And it's the church of Laodicea. I like to call it the lazy church. Because they really weren't, you know, they, they thought they were rich because they had lots of money, because they had a roof over their head, clothes on their back. They thought they had everything they needed. So they didn't need this relationship with their Lord. And oftentimes that's where we get. Well, I go to church on Sunday, I give my time, I got food on my table, clothes on my back, a roof over my head. We're good, we're tight, man. Me and Jesus got this thing going on, right? He understands me, I understand him. That's kind of the Laodicean attitude. To the church of the angel of the Laodicea, right, the amen, the one and only, the truth, the knowledge, the, the, the way, the way, the truth, and life, if you would. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds. I know what you're doing. I know your deeds. I know your ways. I know your religion. Yeah, you're going to church on Sunday. You're giving time. You're lifting up your hands in worship. He says, I know your deeds. He says, but you're neither cold nor hot. You're not cold. You're not hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. You know, it, cold water is really good. Cold milk is really good. Cold coffee is really good. Hot coffee is really good. Hot water is very useful. You know, hot milk. <laughs> Some people like it. <laughs> it says, but, you know, you're not, you're just kind of that lukewarm state. Lukewarm coffee, man, it's just awful. Lukewarm milk is just awful. Lukewarm water, when you're hot and thirsty, it's 
not, it, it, it does a little bit, but he says, you're neither cold nor hot. Cold being way far from God. That's the cold relationship, right? You're, there's a great distance between you and God. Then there's this hot relationship. You're on fire, man. You're serving. You're doing good things. Jesus said, I wish you were one or the other. I wish you were on fire for me, or I wish you were great distance from me. Because if you're on fire with, for me, I could use you. If you're, there's a great distance between me and you, I could work on you. But you're just kind of like lukewarm state. You don't see your need for me. And what does he say? So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You make me sick. You make me want to vomit. Man, you get that sip of lukewarm milk, you just spew it out of your mouth. That's what Jesus says about you. If you're neither hot nor cold. He says, you make me sick. You're thinking you're all that. you got your religious system. He says, you make me want to sick. Go throw up. Because you say I'm rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You have no salvation, is what he's saying. You think you're rich. You're rich in the material things of this world, but you're not rich in me. You're rich in, in your stuff, but you're not rich in a relationship. Now listen to what he goes on to say about them. Verse 20. He says, but I stand at the door and knock. Now consider who's knock, whose door he's knocking on here. We often think it's the lost. And we hear just as I am playing on the piano. You know, the preacher trying to encourage people to come forward. Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. Just open up and let him in. Which is a good thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But he's not talking to the lost. He's talking to you guys, the church people. That's who he's talking to. He's not talking about the lost. He's, the one that's, he's talking to the people that sit in the pew, that come to church every Sunday, who give tithes, who's gotten baptized, who serve. That they serve, they do these things, but their hearts are far from him. They're not in a relationship with him. He says, hey guys, I'm knocking on the door of your heart. Just open up. Let me come in. I will eat with you. I will dine with you. Hey, we'll have a relationship together. But there comes a point, you see, when that door is shut. He's also the door, as we see in Revelation chapter 5. I saw the right hand of God. No, I'm sorry, chapter 4. He says, in these things I looked, and behold, a door standing in heaven. So he's the door, but he's also knocking on the door of our hearts. We, he, and his door today is standing wide open. Just as it was in the days of Noah, for 120 years, that door of salvation stood wide open. But there's going to come a point that that door will shut. And then people will be banging on his door. Let me in! He says, I don't know who you are. You had an opportunity, man. But the time has come. The door's shut. No one can get in. That's what he's saying to these Jews who were 1,500 years they had the law. They had the rules and regulation, but they didn't really have a relationship with him at this point. Verse 26, Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. We know who you are. You ate and drank in our presence. He says, Yeah, exactly. That's my point. You see, it's not association. It's not just being a member who comes to church. I was talking to a lady this past weekend, and uh, she had her own personal lifestyle. She and her friend. She said, "Well, we know Jesus. We 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 don't. We believe there's a God. That's exactly her words. We believe there there's a God. We just don't go to church. We under so but that's, that's the problem. We think this because we believe." We're safe, we're sound, we're secure. But we're not. Believing is not enough. You can believe in Jesus. You can believe in what he's done for you. But that's not enough. He says, and he will say, I tell you, I do not know from where you come. Depart from me, all you evildoers. 
In that place there will be weeping, there will be gnashing of teeth. And when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, you yourselves will be, or, will, or, you yourselves being thrown out, and they will come from east and west and from north and to south and, and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. You, you know, you've got all this time. You've had all these riches. You've had your religion. You've had your programs. You, you, you were associated with the church. You, you were here on Sunday mornings. You may even be here on Sunday nights or Wednesday night. He says, but that doesn't mean a thing. It's not about association. It's about relationship. He says, I don't know you. You can be here, but I don't know you. You know, somebody can come in every Sunday morning and, and plant themselves in that back row every Sunday morning and, 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 and then leave immediately after service. And if I'm not talking with them, if we're not talking to one another, I'm not going to get to know that person. Jesus says, you can be here, but you've got to be communing with me. You've got to be in communication with me. And that place, and they're weeping and gnashing of teeth. They, some people really try to spiritualize health. Well, it, it's not really fire. It's not really burning. It's really not a burning hell. But I'm just reminded of I, or the rich man and Lazarus. They both died and went to hell. And uh, there was, it, before Jesus died, there was two chambers in hell. There was paradise, and there was a, a, this place of peace and comfort. And then there was another place across this great big old gulf called the, the, the place of outer darkness. It was actually the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I think about the, the rich man who was in that place of agony. We're, we're, we're told that he could see, he could touch, he could smell, he could taste. He had all of his feelings and emotions. You know, you're just not going to be some spirit that's drifting off into you know, a, a place of darkness. It's going to be a place of torment. And they will come from east and west and from the north and the south and recline at the table. Verse 30, And behold, some who are last will be first and some first who will be last. Just at that time, some of the Pharisees approached him saying, Go away, leave here, for Herod wants to kill you. So they're trying to, you know, we can't get rid of him by tricking him or by humiliating him. Let's try to scare him. Let's try to get him out of here. Let's tell him that Herod's out to kill him. Just as that time, some, okay, verse 32, we're getting there. He said to them, go and tell that fox, that evil one, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I reach my goal. Of course, he's speaking symbolically. He's got three days that he's going to reach his goal in Jerusalem, but he's also, there's going to be three days and three nights Well, he'll be in the, just like Jonah, in the belly of the great fish, in the center of the earth, and then there'll be a resurrection and then when that resurrection takes place, Satan's hold, the power, his power will be broken for all eternity. And so too for you today. Satan's power, whatever's got you, whatever's hanging on to you, can be broken. If you just simply, this go, look, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Nevertheless, I'm on a journey tomorrow and today and the next day, for it cannot be that, that, the, that a prophet would perish outside of Jerusalem. Prophet after prophet after prophet had been sent to Israel. Of course, the focus here is upon Israel, and they killed all the prophets. He says, O Jerusalem, the cities that kills the prophets and stones, those set to, sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and, 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 and you would not have it. This is interesting. There's a story of Socrates. You know, uh, Socrates was... Uh, accused of corrupting the children of, of Athens, corrupting their minds. Of course, that was a false charge that was against him. And the executioner, we're told, that, that was going to put him to death, wept over Socrates because he knew this charge against him was false. And I find it interesting. Jesus is looking over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, who's rejecting him. Jerusalem, who will, who will kill him. This is a, so it's not the executioner that's weeping at this point. It's the one who's being executed. He's not weeping for himself. He's, look, he's weeping over all the lost children of Israel. He's weeping for them. 
And today, Jesus weeps for you. If you continue to reject him, he weeps for you. He's the one that was executed. He's the one that was put to death. But his heart still goes out to you nonetheless. Now, final point. <laughs> Behold, your house is left to you desolate. I say to you, listen, this is it. This changes everything right here. I say to you. He says, I say to you, you will not see me. See, that our salvation comes in seeing him. You will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Once you look upon the cross of Calvary, he, he woos you from the cross. He's wooing you. He says, look, I've died for you. He says, when I am high and lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. So he woos us. But it's not until we say, look, and accept what he's done. He draws us to the cross, but we've got to come to that point that says, I receive that. It's when we say, I receive that, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's when, we, when it comes to we see that, that our hearts will begin to change. Once we see what he's done for us, he, our hearts are open, his spirit moves in, and that transformation begins to take place. Just like that woman that was finally touched by Jesus. Maybe you're in that place where you've been coming to church day after day, week after week, maybe for 18 years, just playing the role. You know, you know so I'm going to heaven because I'm associated. Maybe that's been you. But Jesus is saying, look at me, gaze upon me, realize what I've done for you, and you'll begin to experience salvation. Amen. Let's just close there. Um, as the worship team comes forward. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for blessing us. We thank you for the salvation has come to us. We thank you for working on us and then giving us an opportunity after opportunity to finally come to that place where we open our hearts and receive you. Lord, we know when that takes place that there, there will be a true freedom.